So yeah, my name's Dave. Um, I work on the .NET project system. And the first question that anyone asks me when I say that is, what's a project system? So just quickly, because I want to tell you, um, and because the PowerPoint template had this slide and I thought, oh, I can type in words. It actually even just said project in the middle. I'm like, it's perfect. So the project system, it's part of VS, part of Visual Studio. Um, so I kind of work on Visual Studio every day, which is weird because it's a Windows app. Um, not many people work on them anymore. Um, but we sort of sit in the middle of a bunch of things that you've heard of. Um, and we're in the middle and no one's heard of us, which is interesting. So uh, you know, the C-sharp compiler has to compile your code. We tell it what files there are. We get that from your project file, but we don't read the project file. MS Build reads the project file. So we talk to MS Build. And so we kind of ferry around all this information. Um, but what it means is that we're in the middle of a bunch of different things. And I joined the team in September 2018. And so in, in almost a year and a half, um, I have sort of learned so many little things that I wish I knew, like in my previous role when I was in charge of all the build systems and everything else. Um, so I sort of put this together as a, it's a run through of the things that I think are most important to understand about project files and MS build and that sort of thing. Hopefully, maybe new to most of you, all of you. Um, let me know if it's not and I'll just skip on, that's fine. Um, so the first question is, what is a project file? And this is just to give you a bit of perspective from where I'm coming from, because a project file, you probably know it's how you open things in Visual Studio, right? Well, a project file is really an MS build file. Um, every project file you look at is just an MS build file. And so when you run MS build on the command line, it builds your project file. And when you open VS, it's the same thing. Um, and so that's kind of where I say that we get information from MS build. There is nothing, um, well, with an asterisk there, there's nothing special about a project file that tells VS something that it's not also telling MS build, let's say. Um, so that's the perspective I'm coming from. But there are two types of project files that you hopefully are aware of. Um, who's using the new style project files, the SDK style? A few hands, all right, awesome. So, <laughs> well, and not only, that's fine. Um, so yeah, there's, there's two sort of styles of project file now that exist. And I think that maybe is confusing. So in case you haven't seen one, on the uh, right is a legacy uh, project file. And on the left is the fantastic new hotness of the SDK style project file, uh, my favorite of the two. Um, they look completely different, right? But fundamentally, both of these are MS build files. And both of these build in MS build with essentially nothing, well, MS build reads these files and it knows how to build things. There's no special magic about .NET Core that helps that one on the left build. There's a little bit of hidden something, but I'll show you that tonight. But it's, it's kind of important, or it's, I think it's easy to forget that these project files are just build files. And particularly um, if you've got a build system or your build scripts using something like Cake or Fake or Sake, PS Sake, however you pronounce that one. Um, there's all these sort of build things now that um, people use to get away from MS build, but fundamentally they're all still using MS build because these files are MS build files. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with what I'm trying to get across is, is to maybe not be afraid of it. Um, so the fundamental difference between these two though is the one on the left simply has more stuff sort of defined by default. That's really all it is. Um, everything on the right is needed to build and all of that, that guff there pretty much, is included in the other one. You just can't see it because basically we worked out that you don't really care about it. I think that's fair because I don't care about it. Um, so the way this works is the difference between the two basically, from my perspective, is imports versus SDKs. So what I mean by that, if we look at the project here, we have this SDK. This is where it gets the name SDK style. Um, and that Usually you think of the .NET Core SDK, but if you look, the target framework there actually says Net 472. Both of these two project files are console apps that target the full desktop framework. 
And so that's sort of point number one, in case you didn't know. SDK style projects are not exclusive to .NET Core. Because they are just MS build files, anything MS build can build, you can express in a shorthand uh, project file. What the SDK does is it defines a bunch of those standard things. And it does that with imports, which is what we see in the legacy projects. And they're, they're laid out in the legacy project system. It says import this project. And it's got a path there to MS build extensions path. And if you can read it, it's very small. Um, and down the bottom, there's MS build tools path. And all these things come from various places in the environment. But fundamentally, both of these two projects say, pull in a bunch of stuff from something that's installed on my machine, be it .NET Core, be it the .NET Framework, etc. It's just that we express it differently now. So the way this works, or what I refer to this as, is an implicit import. So that SDK equals whatever, that's an implicit import, meaning that's really an import statement, it's just you can't see it. And I'll show it for real in a minute. But there's a couple of different implicit imports that happen. And one in particular, which I didn't know about, and maybe you do, um, that can really, well, it's interesting. So let me just switch over to Visual Studio. Um, I assume this is big enough because the resolution's really low. So this is uh, a project I have that I'm, with just a personal project. Um, and it's got a bunch of projects. It's not very exciting. It's a WinForms app, um, although it is targeting .NET Core. None of that is relevant. Like nothing I'm saying today is exclusive to .NET Core. Um, but all I have here, in fact, I can open the, whoa, where'd it go? <laughs> I can open the folder. Um, so all I have here, oh no, you can't see that file. I swear, I don't have anything here. Uh, yeah, so this is just a bunch of project files. Um, if we look in here, there's a bunch of directories, right? They just have project files, nothing special. I can, however, create a specially named file that I bet you can guess the name of now if you were paying very close attention called, woo, if I can type, directory.build.props. So directory.build is one of these implicit ex imports. It's something that will be imported, but you don't have to express it in your project file. And this is like my number one thing I wish I knew about 10 years ago, or starting 10 years ago. Um, what this does, the way this works, is that any project in this folder will automatically import a directory build.props file if it exists. And if it doesn't exist in this folder, it will look up at its parent folder. And if it doesn't exist there, it'll look in its parent folder, et cetera, et cetera. So all these projects I have in these subdirectories will all find this props file I just created and import it. I can also create another file called directory.build.targets. And I can open them both in Visual Studio for future uses. Um, and this one will also get picked up by any projects using the same directory scanning infrastructure. Um, and so what this does is it lets you do some interesting things, let's say. I think my next slide. Oh, right, whoops. OK. Before I explain how that works and what that's for, briefly, how does MS Build work? So this is the world's simplest MS build definition. Uh, if MS build is open source, you can look at the code, but let's pretend it looks like this. MS build has properties and it has items. And properties are key value pair, strings, strings, that's it. And items are a list of things and each thing, each item has a property bag essentially. So that's all it is, right? So if we had two MS build projects, and one imports the other somehow via some mechanisms, none born for which. Hopefully, you can read that, it's not too small. But essentially, what MS build does is it will read in the files in the order that they're expressed, and it will read them from top to bottom in the order things appear in the file. So, in this example, MS build will read in the first one, it'll say so there's a property called foo, it will set it to bar. Great. There's a, an item which is of type, so items have a type as well, but let's ignore that. It's a compile item, and it says include, which is the key. So it's got an item, uh, an item called essentially main.cs, and then that has property about it, which is my metadata equals xam. Now, because naming is hard, properties 
are called properties and item properties are actually called metadata. And I don't know of a good reason for this, but that's just what they're called. And then it'll read in the second file and it'll see there's a property called foo set to baz. So it will update that entry in the dictionary. And then it'll see that we've got an update to our main.cs item. So it'll update the metadata for it to be zim, right? Very simple, straightforward, think of this as dictionaries. The important thing to know is if we flip these two files around, a property set is essentially add or update, whereas an item set, include is add, and update is, uh, update is like update, but only if it already exists, which is not a method name that exists on dictionary, so my whole example just breaks down. But anyway, in this example, the difference here, so, our property foo will be set to bar at the end because we're just reading start to back. Our compile item, the metadata will be set to zam and MS build will never see, essentially never see that metadata equals zim bit because the first thing we're saying is, hey, update this item and it doesn't exist yet. That's the key difference between items and properties. So anyway, back to our directory build props. What can we do with this? So code reuse. Um, one thing that we on the project system team think and want you to think is your project files are code. So I'm in Visual Studio, I can double click this file and it opens. I don't know whether any of you have used that, but you can, only with SDK style projects. Um, this is one of my favorite features because it's like the first thing I ever worked on. So, but we want you to think of these things as code because essentially our aim is to make project files, I won't say make them approachable, because that's a little bit, maybe could be taken the, the wrong way, but it's, let's say, in recognition of the fact that legacy project files weren't approachable, and we want to make you not afraid of them. <laughs> so double click to open, fine. So there's a few properties I'm setting here, and the last two here, uh, in particular, are I'm setting the language version to preview, because I always want to use the latest compiler version, and I'm turning on nullable analysis, which if you haven't looked at .NET Core yet, .NET Core 3 has nullability analysis for null reference types. Um, basically, I'm just saying, yep, give me all of the latest features. So the thing is, I have to do this in, this is my Windows Forms project. Um, I have a game engine. I have to set the same two properties. I have a rendering engine. I've set the same two properties. And if you were writing C-sharp code and you had a method that always had the same little batch of code, you would, you know, presumably, put that somewhere more useful. And so with the directory.build.props and targets and things, we can do the same sort of thing. So if we go back to our file system, every project in any of these directories is going to automatically pull in the contents of this directory build props. So I can simply move these two lines of code here into my file, which I've left here. So I'm just gonna do this. And then, so if I define a property group here, I can paste in these same two lines and make it neat and save. And it should be colored, but it's not. Um, so I can now go through and I can remove all of this code because I don't need to express it anymore. So our project files that were originally already kind of small, get even smaller. So MS build is gonna process this file. It's gonna automatically import my directory build props, which I'll show you how that works in a minute. It's gonna set these properties, right? And it's all gonna work. So we can do things like, you can kind of think of this as a method call, I, kind of. Like you can imagine your project file is saying, hey, go grab directory build props. That's kind of like, go and do whatever that method does, right? So we can get code reuse, that's pretty cool. We can go further. We can get better package references. So the other thing that you probably didn't notice, but um, is, so Skia Sharp is a drawing library. Um, it's a .NET port of a Google native, um, or wrapper, I think it's a wrapper, not a port, but anyway. So this uses Skia Sharp because this is the main entry point to my app. And of course, my rendering engine also uses Skia Sharp. And every package reference I have has the version in it.
But if I get those versions wrong, if I get them out of whack, then you know, that's not going to be good. So if you have the same situation in your C-sharp code, the way you would solve this is you probably have like some kind of constant for, how, for what version to use. And you can do that. Um, and some of the .NET projects, like the open source Microsoft.NET projects, do this. They will use the directory build props here to define something like, uh, you know, skier sharp version and set that to 1.68.1. .1. I'm not even going to bother typing that because I can't bother. Um, and then I can use that here because MS Build lets me use properties with this funky dollar syntax. And I can do that. And that's all cool, but um, the tooling for NuGet doesn't like that, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work, really. And when you're using variables, it gets harder to read because if I look at my project file now, I've got to go and find where that variable is declared. And there isn't, yeah, I can't press F12 in MS Build, annoyingly. Um, so there is another approach, though. So if I take this reference and I move it to our directory build props here, and so NuGet references are um, items, not properties, but you know, same thing. Oops. So what's going to happen now is every project in a subdirectory of this will automatically reference Gear Sharp, which seems good, but it's not because, of course, my game engine doesn't reference Gear Sharp because that's part of rendering. And in some glorious future where I have a billion hours to work on this game, I could have a completely different rendering engine using something else. So I don't want this to reference Gear Sharp. So, whoops. So this include here is not actually what I want. I want the project to say, um, basically put it back. <laughs> and I want the project to say, yeah, I need Gear Sharp. But I want that to be the end of it for the project. I want the version to come from somewhere else. So if we remember back to our terrible model of MS Build, this is an item, so include will add it to our dictionary. So later on, we can update this item in the dictionary. Right? The version tag doesn't have to come here as long as it comes at some point in the processing of this file and all of its imports. So if I take this and I move it to our directory build targets, so the magic between props and targets is that targets are at the end, props are at the start. So if I do this and I change this to, whoops, change this to update. So what's going to happen now, MS Build is going to load our project. It's going to load our directory build props, which has got nothing new getty in it. It's going to go through our project, which says include Skier Sharp. So now it's got a reference to a NuGet package, but it doesn't know the version, right? That seems wrong, but it'll get to the end of the project. It'll import our targets file because it's in a parent directory. And now we go and update our Skier Sharp item. And that'll update, uh, you know, if you, you can kind of think of it as it updates every reference to Skier Sharp in every project. But in reality, each project is built individually. But that'll update any reference that has been added to a project will now be set to 1.68.1. .1. And so this is how the sort of more modern way to do NuGet package referencing is. And that's how we do it in the project system. And what it means is that our packages are still opt-in at the project level, but our versions are all defined centrally. Now, the way I can actually just quickly show you in the project system repo, so the way this actually works for, for real is that directory build props and targets tend to get a bit big. Uh, so if we look in here, we have this. So this is the directory build targets for everything in the .NET project system. And we import this file called packages.targets. And this is where I like to think of them as method calls, because essentially we're saying this file just does NuGet stuff. So all this does, wow, this screen is, is this, tiny. Um, so all this file does is set a bunch of versions on a bunch of package references. Like there's heaps of them in here. Because all of the various projects in this repository all use this file to define their versions. So it's all central. If you want to know where, what version we're using, you go to this file. Right? This is 
this, this sort of style of doing things is actually so common that um, NuGet are working on formalizing this. And basically there'll be a special file like directory build props. I think it's currently called directory, directory.packages.targets is the official name. And that will automatically be imported and that will automatically do all of this work that you can essentially mirror. Um, so yeah, so, and this is why I like thinking of as method call because essentially you don't, in the ideal world, you don't put everything in directory build props and directory build targets, but you put references to other files in there. So it's kind of like calling a method, say, hey, set all the package versions. So that's all well and good, but it's kind of hard to actually see that. So let me just save all of this and I can show you what MS build sees. So if you're doing any kind of um, writing any project files or build scripts or anything for your CI CD, especially if the build is failing and you don't know why, or it fails on CI CD but works on your machine or vice versa, um, slash PP is one of your friends. There's three friends. This is one of them. Um, slash PP, it, it actually means, I think it's pre-process, um, but I'm, I'm so unsure of that because I only ever use slash PP. So what this does, I'll just run it because it's fun. Does that. <laughs> so if you're paying keen attention or can pause the video later, um, <laughs> what this does, let me, let me do that. Um, this basically pre-processes the file. So this loads your project in MS build. It processes all of the imports and nothing else, and then outputs the end result of this project. So this project, if we just go, uh, so this project, whoa, okay, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I was gonna do that, but the font is too big. So I think, I think the project here is, it's like about 20 lines long. Our slash PP output though, is 12,989 lines long, right? So this is what MS build sees. When you say build my project, this is the file it processes. So the reason this is good is this tells you everything that's going on. So when I said that an SDK attribute was really an import, we well, can see it right here. Here is the import tag. It even adds a comment that says this import was added implicitly, right? Like it's even telling you what it's doing. But essentially when you say SDK equals Microsoft.net.sdk.windows.desktop, what that means is MS Build will go and find the version of .NET you're using, find the right SDK, and it will import it. In this case, it's come from program files. So I'm using 3.1.200 preview whatever. I don't know. Um, I, I, I have all sorts of .NETs on here because like the Visual Studio I'm using is literally the master build of VS and it just installs whatever it wants. Um, but so you can see this is coming from a file called sdk.props, right? Props go at the start. If we scroll all the way to the end, there's sdk.targets because targets go at the end, right? So every, every file, mm, no, not every file, <laughs> but the convention is props go at the start, target to the end. And then it's, you know, it's married up. It's like a stack. You pop this one on, eventually your project. So if we keep scrolling down, we will see, so the, I'm using the Windows desktop SDK. It imports the standard .NET SDK. So then that imports that. And if we keep scrolling down, I'm just gonna search for Skia Sharp here. Um, oh, <laughs> and because I updated the wrong project, I can't show you. <laughs> so, okay, hang on, what project, what project did I do? Oh, I did rendering. Right, don't look at the man behind the curtain. Uh, .NET build, <laughs> oops, wrong way. <laughs> Live demos, okay, that was, very quick. Hmm. That's a worry. Is, it, is this an empty file? No. Cool. How many lines? Oh, only 11,000. So it's tiny. Um, so now if I search for Skia Sharp, so I will see here's my include, right? So this is my project file. This is where diagnosing things, this comes in really handy. If I had this backwards and I put my update in my project file and the include in the targets file, this would show it because the first hit for Skia Sharp would be an update and you would think, ah, hang on, update doesn't add. That's my problem, right? If my build failed because Skia Sharp wasn't referenced, for example. So here's my project file. And if I look again, here's my directory build targets. So it's implicit because I didn't have to say, go and import this file. 
MS Build found the file by looking up a thing, right? So this is where, so slash PP is really good for diagnosing these issues because you can see exactly what's happening and you can see the order, right? MS Build processes from the top all the way down of this file. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, right here is an interesting thing, Microsoft.common.targets, that was one of the two import statements in the legacy project system. So the same imports that make your legacy projects work still actually do all of the heavy lifting here. They're just included silently and there's more defaults. Um, so some interesting things we can see uh, if we look for compile. So you know how you don't have to specify every single file in your SDK style projects? That's because this line exists, which says, well, it doesn't say star.cs because of course VB is a thing that exists too. So it says star dot default language extension. Um, but in C sharp projects that's set to .cs and this works. This one line replaces every single compile element in your legacy project systems. So it's just these sensible defaults and implicit imports that make all the magic work. And so once you sort of reason about MS Build in this way, and you can think, right, well, I can see what MS Build sees. I know about, you know, updating things in my dictionary or adding things, whatever. Um, I just, I've just found that everything becomes more easy to understand. Um, hopefully, you do too, but... Anyway, <laughs> all right, performance summary. Okay, so while we're on the command line um, and while we're thinking about, um, about diagnosing build issues, if your builds take too long, there's something you can, I think it's CLP, I always forget this. I'm just gonna do a build. So this is doing a build. Uh, CLP is console logger parameters. And so this is an extra parameter that is passed specifically to the console logger of MS Build. Um, but so this performance summary is a general MS Build concept, right? I'm obviously using the console logger here. Um, so this one outputs, oh, this scroll is so touchy <laughs> on the font size. Um, so this is a summary of every task MS Build does, how many times it was called and how long it took. And some of them will be no ops, Right, so they'll be really fast. So like this delete, it probably didn't delete anything, but it got called to check if it had to or something. Um, this one's really cool because at the bottom here, we can see exactly what is taking the time in our builds. So if your build is too slow or if Visual Studio is unresponsive, this can be a good thing to do to work out why. Compiling my code took three seconds and MS build, which is basically saying building other projects took 3.7 seconds. That's, that's probably fine for a C Sharp app this build is not particularly slow, um, but things start to stick out here when you've got build problems. Like you would see, you know, C sharp compile takes six seconds and MS build maybe took, you know, seven seconds. And then there'll be one random task that took 34 seconds. You're like that's probably the problem. Um, so that's sort of, you know, we can see what MS build sees. We can get some more info out, but we're all developers, so we don't want to see summaries and stuff. Let's talk about build logging. Um, how many of you have poured over MS build logs and tried to make sense of what's going on? It's pretty horrible. So there is another command line thing called slash BL. BL stands for binary log, I think, or bin log, but either way. So again, this is going to do a build. What this has done is created a file here called msbuild.binlog. And this file, has all of the information in it. Um, so I believe there was a talk on the MS Build Structured Build Logger not long ago. So hopefully this is somewhat familiar. Um, but if not, if you go to msbuildlog.com, you can download this wonderful tool. Uh, it's open source. You can fix bugs in it too. Um, and what this does is it shows you, it's like another view into, so, so slash pp tells us everything that MS Build sees when it's about to build. This is everything MS Build sees as it's building. This is every piece of information. I can literally go to this project and I can say view. This is my project file. Like all of the information is inside this bin log file. This is just a zip file, you know, right? But so this project imports a bunch of, or tells to other build a bunch of other projects. I can right click on this project. That's what that project looks like, right? This bin log is super detailed. The the thing to remember with bin logs, because they're super detailed, um, 
if you send them to someone, that someone can see your project files. This is important to note because, you know, if your code is proprietary, you might not want that to happen. So there's an asterisk there. Um, every now and again, like if you log a, if you log a bug on um, our GitHub repo, you, like we often say, can you send us a bin log? And we have to put a link there to a thing explaining like, in fact, even worse than that is like environment variables. Like there can literally be passwords in these things. So just be warned, it does contain everything. I don't think this session ID is important, but I don't know. Hopefully you can't write it down and hack my machine. Um, there's, a, there's, there's all sorts of things in here. But so what this is good for is, again, for diagnosing issues. So let's say I, I will look for Skia Sharp again. If there was a problem where it wasn't referenced and, sh and I thought it should be, right? I can see everywhere that MS Build thinks this is relevant. So here I can see in my, in my project file, I have a package reference to Skia Sharp. It has a version. That's good, right? If that was missing, then that's where I probably got my includes and updates back to front, right? And, and you can see it's, I mean, it's mentioned everywhere. There's so much detail in here. Um, the other, like, oh, here we go. This is, this is where it found the file. Um, oh, I can't scroll. Oh, no. I think it's going to crash. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> As I say, it's open source. You too can fix bugs. Um, <laughs> that one's yeah, that one's really good. So if if um, one thing that's that's a common problem, let's say, is where you think you're referencing this version, and even if you are referencing this version, sometimes MS Build like that package reference gear sharp that version 1.68, right? That's not real. That doesn't mean anything. What we what we really have to do is find the DLL that corresponds to, and that's what gets sent to the compiler. Um, yeah, see, I can't even alt-tab to an email. Um, what that spot was where it was crashed is literally the command line parameters to the C-sharp compiler that says every single DLL. So every now and again, you know, MS Build will find this wacky DLL over here and go, oh, I'll use this one. And well, that could be why your build is failing, right? It's not doing what you expect. So binary logging is cool. But if I'm honest, most of the time command line builds other things that work and your Visual Studio builds other things that failed. Or IntelliSense doesn't work, which means that a different build has failed. So there's a way to get this information as well. Uh, and it is an extension. Um, and I can't go online. But it is called Project System Tools. It is written by our, my team, essentially, a guy on my team named Paul mostly, um, and it is another way to look at what's going on with MS Build, but specifically inside Visual Studio. So if I open up this build logging window, we can see it. Um, so let me, let me pin that. Oh, that'll do. I don't have a lot of real estate. So if I, um, let's add a file. So if I add a file to this project, and I'm just going to add an empty glass. What's going to happen, hopefully, maybe, maybe not. What should happen, hmm, OK. Let me try removing a file. OK, it's not working. Now we have the fun thing of, do we try a different build of Visual Studio and hope for the best, or do we, oh, let's, let's not risk it. I'm just doing a normal build. No, nope, this isn't working either. OK, so <laughs> what's supposed to happen here is you should see an item here for every single build that Visual Studio does. Um, I am going to start a different instance. And uh, let's hope I have the extension installed, shall we? I do. All right, cool. So this is the current preview release of Visual Studio, which should be more stable. And if I create a new project, yay, there's a build, cool. 
So you can see there there's three builds that have happened inside VS, which is weird because we haven't built anything yet, right? There is no DLL that exists for this app. These are called design time builds. Oh, my license will expire. I wonder if that's a problem. Um, so these are called design time builds. And these are builds that happen in the background in Visual Studio. So when I said that we, so the project system, we're the ones who tell Visual Studio what to put in Solution Explorer, right? So we, we're the ones responsible for saying this project has a program.cs. But as I said, we don't read the project file. We, we get MS build to. So we have to essentially, we don't, have to, we don't do a full build to find that out, but let's, for the sake of argument, say, we essentially tell MS build, hey, go and do a bunch of work to discover everything that's in this project. Now, some of it it does without a build, so reading the files doesn't actually take a build. That's called evaluation. That's separate. But things like package references, um, the way to think about it is, so we can read files without needing a build, but if we have to go and do any real work, then we need a build. It doesn't have to be a build that compiles code, but it's a build that spins up all the MS build infrastructure. And, so it does, and that's referred to as a design time build. Um, and so package references is a good example because package references, you know, the NuGet DLL has to go off to the internet and see what the latest version is. If you've got an asterisk in your version or it's got to yeah, do a bunch of work. And if you look at this targets element down here, um, you can see here there's a collect package references, right? That, so that's going to collect them all and then there'll be something that resolves them. It's a, oh, there you go, resolve. Um, so this is a view to what's going on inside Visual Studio. And you can sort of see a, you know, a tree-ish thing. It's kind of like structured build logger, but not quite. So if you right click and you go open logs external, this just opens it up back in structured build logger. So you can see everything that's going on inside Visual Studio. So this is really handy for when you have a failure in Visual Studio that's not, that, that doesn't fail on the command line. Because on the command line, you go slash BL and you get a build log. And then in Visual Studio, you use this tool and you get a build log. And you look at the tool and you go, oh, that's missing, right? And then that's how you start to track down. So if things like um, IntelliSense stops working, right? So when I go console dot, if that didn't show up a list of things, one of your design time builds has failed. Because that list comes from you know, system.dll. System.dll has to come from somewhere on your file system. MS build does a build in order to find where that file is, right? To run all the code necessary. In fact, we can see here, resolve framework references design time. That's the task that you know, does that. So build logging, if you want it, is, is good. Except obviously not in the master branch because this still hasn't done anything. Um, and I think there's, yeah, one more, cool. So the last little trick here, um, and actually this should be in the preview. Let's have a look. Yeah. So I just click show all files in Solution Explorer and it added, well, it added the bin and object directory, which we're all used to, but it also added this node called imports. And this is new in 16.5, which is, I think it's new in the preview that's currently out. Um, what this is, is a list of, oh, don't tell me it's hung again. Oh God. <sighs> Let's try over here. That works. So this is a list of all of our implicit exports, right? So this is going through MS build, building up that project file, and then just plucking out the imports and showing them. So our project imports sdk.props from, you know, this path, which is whatever, discovered. That then imports microsoft.common.props. That then imports directory build props. So we go from our project out to .NET, out to a bit more of .NET, back to our directory over here, right? This, and you can see all of these things in the order they get imported. You can double click to open them. Anything that is in your directory, you, I can edit this. You see this has a padlock, it's read only, right? I can't just go and modify the SDK. Um, so the imports is, it's, it's like the, the sort of a summary view into all of MS build, but this one is, this one is especially good for things like NuGet. So you can see here, uh, or actually I don't, annoyingly, I don't think I have any, no. But so NuGet packages can deploy with them props and targets files. So part of your build actually comes from your NuGet packages. So this is really good for showing those things because if you go through the, you know, before imports, right? This is, this is the NuGet stuff before NuGet tells 
the build to import the stuff from the packages. So you'd see various, um, various NuGet things happening, depending on what projects you reference. I don't happen to. Um, if, if NuGet packages need to affect the build. So this is a really good way of seeing that without having to go through that 12,000 line file. And that I think is it. So in summary, because that was a little bit rambling and I apologize, project files weird. Um, the things to remember is, so project files are MS build files, right? You're, you can't escape MS build. That's actually not true. Uh, you can, but it's a really bad idea. But you totally can. You can call the CSC compiler on the command line and pass in all of the DLLs you want. I used to do that. It was a terrible system, but it worked. Just. Um, but yeah, project files are MS build files. So whether you're using Cake or PowerShell or whatever you're using, it is worth learning a little bit about how the MS build works because that's what you're using, right? Um, and then, with, especially with SDK style things, your project files are code. If you think about them as code, because that's what we do. They're not magic for Visual Studio. There is stuff in there for Visual Studio. Um, I can show you that since I think we have plenty of time. Um, let me, where's my output file? That one. Uh, let's go project capability. Here we are. Project capability include equals generate documentation file. That file, uh, that line, does nothing for your build. It does not affect your DLLs at all. All that does is tell some part of Visual Studio that, hey, I know how to generate a documentation file. So realistically, what this probably does is enables that checkbox in the property pages. I don't actually know, but I'm just guessing. Um, there's a bunch of these, right? Oh, it's a C Sharp program. So there is stuff in here that tells Visual Studio what to do, but that's all in the SDK, right? For the most part, your project files should only have your stuff in them. And therefore, you should feel free to manipulate it, right? Um, especially with the SDK style projects. It's much harder these days to actually break Visual Studio when you do that. It's still possible if you try. Um, but so since they're project files, you can do all of the same things you normally do with your code. So you can do you know, code reuse. You can apply, don't repeat yourself, etc. You can separate your concerns, have a packages file that just has versions or just has, I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if all of your projects all reference the same NuGet packages, then you can just have one file that defines them all, and then that's it. Um, and that sort of thing is really cool. I forgot to mention it, but if the stuff you work on, if you're adding lots of projects all the time, so maybe you're not, but where I used to work, we had this, this folder of, uh, it was customer-specific projects, and it was just one folder. It had about 150 projects in it. But you know, every couple of weeks, we'd add a new one for a new customer or a different project. But we wanted them all to be in the same build infrastructure. right? If I'd known about how to do this stuff, I could have defined one directory build props in that folder. And basically, every new project that was added to that subfolder, you just couldn't get it wrong because it was all already defined. right? Whereas instead, it was go new. We had a custom template and visual shares, all that sort of stuff you kind of work around. So, you can apply all your coding practices to project files, which is cool. Um, order is important. That's important to know that because that's, I mean, pretty much the only way I've sort of got this wrong is if I forget that and I put something in props that I meant to put in targets or vice versa. Um, yeah, the, the where things appear, um, slash PP and BL let you see what's going on. That's how you diagnose stuff. Um, and then if you really want to get into it, which you totally can, but that's up to you. Um, you can do function calls, which are tasks, which is essentially go and do this bit of work. Normally, you write a task in a DLL, so in C Sharp, but you don't have to. You can write it in your project file if you want. Um, there is variables, which is basically what properties are in MS Build, so you can apply them too. Um, and then conditionals, which is done with the condition attribute. That's kind of the easiest one. Um, essentially, you know, whenever MS Build reads anything, it will check the conditions, and so. You know, uh, trying to think of a good example. Oh, the last time I used it was so I had a project that is .NET Core, so it's cross-platform. I want you know Mac and Windows. I want to use Visual Studio for Mac and Visual Studio for Windows, depending on what machine I was on. Um, but if I'm on Mac, I can't target .NET Framework. I have to target only .NET Core. If I'm on Windows, I can target both. So you put a condition on the target framework reference uh, element and whatever the last one is or whatever the one that wins is, that's the one that gets used, right? So they're kind of the easiest one, but 
when you apply all these things and you start to think of them as code, you start to build up you know, some sophistication in your project files, or you can if you want. Um, and that's it. That's me. Thank you. <laughs>